you've been stuck to this channel for a while, you'll know that I'm a big fan of Ayn Rand's writing. In fact, I feel like you even kind of look like her a little bit. And that love started off with what's considered one of her greatest books, At the Shrugged. Now, one night several months ago, I went over the various covers of what this book looked like, of all the weird covers that The Shrugged has gone through. And while I was looking through the images, I found one that looked pretty modern. To my surprise, I found out that At the Shrugged had been made into a movie. Much like the book itself, it is separated into three parts. So with this knowledge, I figured I would just start looking at all the popular streaming websites, you know, Netflix and Hulu. I looked through Hulu first because while I hate the idea that you have to pay to get rid of ads, they always had a better selection. However, I did not find any of the parts on there. When I looked to Netflix, though, I was able to find part two, which that's not going to help me any. I mean, uh, I'd like to watch all three parts. It'd be kind of weird to say, pick up this book and then just start uh, from about here and then read onward. You're going to lose so much context. And even though I know what the story is like, I wanted to see what kind of different turns the movie would take. At one time, I was also thinking about trying to buy the DVDs, but that proved to be a little pricey. Of course, for me, more than $5 is a little expensive. In fact, I'm pretty sure I only spent 5 bucks on this book, and uh, yeah, this has got to be the best 5 bucks I have ever spent. But anyway, a few weeks ago, a co-worker of mine told me that At The Shrugged was free to watch on YouTube. I was a little skeptical because they said they can only find parts 1 and 2. I figured I'd take a look into this and found out that YouTube also has part 3. So this is a video I wanted to do for a while. Ever since I found out that one of my favorite books was adapted into a movie, I wanted to make a little comparison video. But getting the movies was the hard part, as I explained earlier. So now that I can actually watch them, I can start comparing them. As you can tell by the title of this video, I'm just going to be comparing part one, as watching all three parts at once would be about five hours. I could put up with about four hours for watching Lawrence of Arabia, but only if it's a two-day affair rather than one whole sitting. So before we get started with comparing the movie and the book, just a few little housekeeping rules, so to speak. Like I said, I will only be doing part one. The main thing is I will not be showing any clips from the movie. I am not sure how intense the copyrights are for this movie, and the amount of editing that would go into such a thing just doesn't seem worth it to me. And obviously, since I am going to be comparing both of these, there is going to be some spoilers. Another thing as well, this is just a prop. There's nothing in it. But I just find it easier to talk about something when I can hold it. Without further ado, let's begin. Hi, another thing as well is this will be a little disjointed. It's not going to be exactly in chronological order, but I will try my best to keep it so. I will definitely say uh, the beginning was a lot less to be desired. As soon as the movie came up and said that it was taking place in the year 2016, I was just like, oh, come on. But after going through the very beginning of the book, I found out that there is no exact date listed. I just always assumed that it was either late 50s or the early 60s. There's a brief mention of color TV, which I'm not sure if that was a thing when this book originally came out in 1957, so I figure it was going for the near future. And since the movie was made in 2012, having it be based in 2016 kind of goes into the very near future kind of idea. So at least that makes sense, but... In all honesty, I was really looking forward to seeing that Art Deco look that made Bioshock so famous. After all, At the Shrugged, as well as The Body of Works by Ayn Rand, 
were heavy inspirations for making Bioshock. So, yeah, that, that, that's my first impression of watching the first 10 seconds of this movie. Then after that, it, it's kind of all over the place, actually. Like, uh, I have some context since I've read the book. I kind of understand the characters as well as the economic problems that are brought up in this, but... To somebody just watching this for the first time, if this was their introduction at the Shrugs, they would be very confused. It's just really a slideshow of all the crazy things going on, like uh, capitalism is not working, there's a Finnish pirate stealing precious metals, something more of a communist regime. And that's all just like the first 10 minutes or so. But one thing to the movie's credit, while I thought the book was insanely scary and in the idea that it was written so long ago and yet it seems to be more of a prophetic work than more of a cautionary tale, this one was even more so because it made all the ideas of what could happen in the book could very well happen within the next few coming years. And that's honestly kind of terrifying. <laughs> Once it starts zooming in on Dagny as well as James Taggart trying to run the railroad, that is when the movie gets back on track. Pun intended. However, I'm very disappointed. In the very beginning of the book, we start on one of our main characters, Eddie Wheeler's who's basically just walking about the city, seeing how the once great metropolis is starting to crumble underneath them, as well as this mysterious chant that people have, who, who is John Galt? Which in the movie they refer as Galt, but who knows, maybe it's like a tomato-tomato sort of thing. And then Eddie, after he takes his walk, he goes into work. We introduce James Taggart. And that is where we bring up this problem of the San Sebastian line, and Eddie presents Dagny's solution to the problem. And then we cut to Dagny, who is on one of their own trains, just trying to make it back to the office, where in the background we hear a piece that sounds very familiar. One of her favorite composers apparently has composed a fifth concerto that she would later realize. At that point, there was only ever four concertos, so it was very weird. While she is making it to the office, the train stops, and she shows her capability of being a good leader. She is able to make it so not everybody panics, and she gets the train going right away. And then there's the argument they have with James Taggart. All that I just mentioned is cut in the movie. They just jump right into James and Dagny talking about the issues of the San Sebastian line. James and Dagny both are very well represented. The only thing that feels a little off is, if I remember correctly, Dagny had brown hair. But in the movie, she's blonde. The actress does a good enough job portraying the character. I am willing to overlook this little oversight. After that little spat, we cut the Hank Reardon with his steel mill. It's a little weird because in the book he is described as having blonde hair, but here he has brown hair. I guess there was a little bit of a mix-up with that minor detail. But the way the factory is shown, as well as it's described in the book, it is practically a mirror image. I think they just nailed it. And I do love the little detail that as the first run of Reardon Metal is being made, he is there on the floor smiling at it. So he looks a bit more like a James Bond villain rather than seeing his 10 year long project finally get realized. And plus in the book he is also described as being on the floor with the foreman help directing where the red hot metal should go and what ingredients should be done. That kind of stuff. So it kind of shows he's a bit more of a common man. Putting him behind the glass and looking at the assembly line just seems like he's a little elitist, like he's almost above everybody. Just like in the book, the Hank of the movie is only interested in making money, and his relatives, his wife, mother-in-law, and younger brother all resent him for that. And all these characters are just as lovably hateful as they are in the book. 
Now, I know that phrase doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but basically these were just characters that you love to hate. The mother-in-law, whatever Hank did, was just never good enough. The wife, it was made very obvious in the book that she just married him for the wealth. And his younger brother basically just wants a free handout without doing any of the work. Since Hank is more the common man that would rather do stuff the hard way and own it of his own free will, he cannot stand for this. All of this is very well portrayed within the movie. I will definitely say that the house that Hank lives in, both are very much described in Living Out of Nowhere. However, I don't know what it is. The way it was written in the book, it felt like a rather modest estate. Well, here in the movie, it is a full-on mansion in the woods. We'll cut ahead to the meeting with the senators. Now, two things that just don't really sit right with this scene. So in general with the movie, Whenever there are interior shots, it just gives you a glimpse of what a more accurate rendition of At the Shrugged on a movie would look like. All the interior shots are very much set in the Art Deco era, and they are all formal occasions, so all the men are wearing suits and all the women are wearing gowns. Much like how the people would have dressed every day back in the 50s when this book originally came out. And... There's even a part where they go to a party and there's smooth jazz playing. And I'm just like, come on, you clearly want to have this more set in an Art Deco era. Why don't you? But we'll get into that later. I think there are a few little tidbits as to why they set it into a modern era. But as for the senators themselves, the thing I found weird is the character of Wesley Mooch. Or at least that's how I read it. He is described as a character that is just dirty. Like the worst type of politician you can have. So it makes a lot of sense that he'd be called Mooch. As in he's like mooching off the system. He's mooching off all of these rich people's wealth. However, in the movie they call him Wesley Mouch. Maybe that's just the correct pronunciation of it. But every time I heard it, I'm just kind of like, that doesn't seem right. All these senators are very well portrayed. They're very briefly described in the books, so I really can't give you a good idea of if they look the way they're described, but I think they play the part very well. The acting is very good, and they both look like very dignified people of the U.S. Senate. So like the book... Hank ends up making a bracelet of his miracle Reardon medal for his wife. However, it's described a lot differently in the book. From what I remember, it was a very plain-looking chain, and that's what the bracelet was. However, here in the movie, it actually looks like a pretty nice piece of jewelry. In fact, even I wouldn't mind wearing it. Also, like in the book, the wife just isn't really too keen on it. But always knew that Hank was a little off anyway, and she likes the thought behind it and keeps it around. However, later, just like in the book, Dagny trades for it with a nice little necklace that she's wearing. After Mexico nationalizes the San Sebastian line, she schedules a meeting with Francisco de Anuncio. Which, I swear, they can never say the same name more than once. When Francisco comes in, it is exactly as I pictured him from the book. Even right down to the idea that he's smart, but he's kind of playing the idea of the playboy with just, like, women on every shoulder. <laughs> and even right down to wearing the nice suit, where it is puffed open and you just see all his chest hair flowing out. The only thing I found a little weird is he doesn't speak with, like, a slight accent, but... In the book, he is described as a third-generation American, so I guess that makes sense. On the topic of this nationalization issue, I feel like it was a much more devastating blow in the book. Here in the movie, it's more like, oh, well, that's bad. But maybe it's the idea that we have a lot less time dedicated to the San Sebastian line as we do in the book. More build-up. More suspense, more of a tragedy. Then there is the establishment of the anti-doggy dog rule. 
which is very well summarized from the book. In the book, it dedicates about like maybe two or three pages to what the anti-dog eat dog rule is. But here you get most of the basics and it's all said very clear and concisely. With this new law in place, wealthy oil baron Ellis Wyatt is forced to go to Taggart Transcontinental. Now while he seems a bit older than I would have thought in the book, the actor they got the portray of just got it perfectly, right down to a T. This actor was very passionate in this job, very much as Ellis Wyatt was very passionate about his oil fields in the book. The same I don't really think can be said for Eddie Wheelers. Now, I've got nothing wrong with the actor who plays him. I think the actor does a really good job. The only thing that just seems a little off is that Eddie Wheelers is black in this version. Maybe it's because it's more of a modern movie, they wanted more diversity, I mean... Other than Francisco, there's really not any other minority in this book, but uh... Let's maybe just leave it at that before the fire start. At Hank's anniversary party, we get a very boiled down interaction between Francisco and Hank. Hank always rather hated Francisco because he got all his wealth from his parents as opposed to Hank, who worked hard for it every single day of his life. But after the conversation, he starts to kind of like Francisco a little bit. And I gotta give major props to the actor that as Francisco walks away from the conversation, you can just see this look in Hank's face that he is sad to see him leave, but at the same time, not enough to reach for him to call him back. That is a really hard thing to try to act out. And that is exactly how it happened in the book. Although I am a little disturbed that Francisco wasn't able to give that awesome speech about the evils of money. But I guess that probably would have added about another 10 or 15 minutes to the entire run of the movie. Now, in the book, it's very much described that Hank and his wife's relationship is not the best. As I said earlier, the wife really just married Hank for his money. And as such, they both just kind of live together, but don't really do much else. In fact, they both sleep in separate bedrooms. It's very much described that the only time that Hank would ever go into her bedroom is if he ever wanted to make sweet, passionate love to her. This is only a minor footnote in here. As you see Hank go into her bedroom, and she just says, do you want to do it? And for those that haven't read the book, they're just going to think that the wife is rather promiscuous in this scene. So with the establishment of the anti-dog-eat-dog rule, no one person is allowed to own multiple businesses. So Hank Reardon has to sign away all his important businesses, except for his smelting yard, because he does not want to sell his formula for Reardon Metal. However, the national government sends a politician in order to persuade Hank to sell the formula to them. However, Hank doesn't budge, saying that it is my formula. I worked on it for a very long time. And then ending with this question, is Reardon Metal good or bad? And like a politician, he never gets a straight answer. And so Hank just simply says, if you can't answer this one question, I'm not selling it to you. And the politician just leaves. This is brilliantly shown in the movie. It's great acting, it's great pacing, it's great directing. And I'm pretty sure if you were to read along with this section in the book, you could literally read apart the whole conversation that happens in this scene in the movie. It's just so good. Scientist at the State Science Institute is a little different than I imagined. I want to say he's... He's foreign. He's played by a foreign-speaking person, so there's a very thick accent. Well, it's made very obvious in the book that the scientist was an American that has been there for quite a few years. There is a bit of a heated exchange as to the idea of weird and metal being a good or bad. And I feel like this scene was far more charged with electricity in the book than it is in the movie. In fact, 
the movie, it, the argument almost seems to happen in what appears to be a church. I still haven't figured that part out. Well, in the book, it is in the confines of the scientist's office and Dagny, so it's just a very fierce back and forth. However, both do a good job in ending on this idea that he runs a state-funded business, and if he starts going against the state, he is going to lose funding. So he just has to agree with them. Then it seems to jump ahead to the 20th Century Motor Company? This is a rather odd move, as this was not mentioned until part two of the book. How it happens in the book is that after all this legislation is passed, it is impossible to get spare parts for anything. So both of them figure that they'd raid this old factory and maybe get a few parts. Plus, by this point in the book, Hank and Dagny kind of have a bit of a relationship, and this is a bit of a romantic getaway. <laughs> However, in the movie, they go after the legendary motor. Hank had some pictures and some blueprints, but wanted to find the real thing. Which I find that a rather odd choice. Also in the movie, the motor is a lot smaller than it's described in the book. In the book, it's practically the size of a large cooler. While here, it's more about the size of a large water bottle. And also the mechanism is a little different. It uses an atmospheric vacuum to generate static electricity. And then that's how it works. Well, in the book, it's described as somehow taking static electricity out of the air and converting it into reliable power. But I will definitely say this to the movie's credit for skipping ahead. They very well summarize what led to the downfall of the 20th Century Motor Company very well, if not in a whole lot of sentences either. In the book, the downfall of the 20th Century Motor Company is described in at least 15 pages. So it was really good that they were able to condense it as much as they did. Another thing that's also interesting is the motor is hidden behind a secret passage. In the book, there is just a giant scrap heap where Dagny just sees a rather odd spool of wire, which Dagny is in need of to be able to fix the telecommunication between the train stations. So she starts to pull at it to realize that there's something attached to it. After a little bit of investigation, she finds this huge motor with that looks like there is a whole lot missing to it. But just like in the book, the motor is useless without the original inventor to be able to power it up. And plus, there is a whole lot missing to both. When they try to figure out who is the last owner of the 20th Century Motor Company, both go through a lot of red tape, all just trying to figure out the inventor of the motor, who owns the rights to the motor, and all that good stuff. Since I read through this section pretty quickly in the book, I was happy to see it was kept at just as brisk of a pace in the movie. Now in both, we are led to a Dr. Atkinson, who is a chef at a rundown diner in the middle of Wisconsin. In the book, he is described as just flipping burgers and serving Dagny her meal. He is just outside smoking. And I, I just love the small detail that there is a gold dollar sign on the cigarette. That was just a great nod to those that read the book because that was the sign of the fraternal organization. However, I gotta give it to the book for this one. Dr. Atkinson was a very well-renowned philosopher at Patrick Henry University. So to see him stoop so low as to just flipping burgers at a roadside diner and actually being happy about this, it just doesn't really compare to having just him out in the middle of nowhere smoking. However, the character is very well portrayed, and he leaves with this idea that the inventor of the motor will find Dagny instead. Now while I mentioned that mysterious cigarette, I feel like this is one of the minor problems with this being set in the modern time. Not too many people smoke anymore. Back when this book came out, and the period it takes place in, everybody smoked. In fact, at the train station Dagny works in, 
there is a cigarette vendor who collects cigarettes from all over the world and tells her that this cigarette is not made by anyone on Earth. Adding more of the mystery. Here it's really more of a, hey, remember the book? As I mentioned before, Hank started to lose most of his businesses, and I just love the subtle detail in the background that both the wife and the mother-in-law are just kind of going there going, as if they were the ones in charge of doing this, and that Hank is getting what he finally deserves. It is just a fantastic detail that I love to hate these characters even more. When Dagny separates from Taggart International to form the John Gout line, it is portrayed pretty much the same in both. The only thing that just feels a little off is in the book, Dagny's new office is something of a dump. While in the movie, it's actually not that bad. In fact, I could imagine that as just being her office at Taggart Transcontinental. I'm also a little disturbed that they cut a very crucial scene out of the movie. So in the book, Beard of Metal has been deemed unsafe by the State Science Institute despite the protest of Dagny. So the National Bureau of Engineers comes to her and says, this poses too much of a risk. Nobody in our company on this train for you. So she asks for volunteers. Now the way it happens in the book is that there is a mile long line of people waiting to go into Dagny's office. It's not until Eddie comes in that he informs her that all these are engineers that still want to fight the good fight. Well, in the movie, they just kind of skip right to her being on the train and just going there. I feel like that ruins a bit of character development because here in the book, it more shows the idea that people are willing to fight. Well, here in the movie, it just seems more like her perseverance and will is what led to finding an engineer. So after the famous test run, I was kind of amazed to see how tasteful the sex scene was between Hank and Dagny was. In the book, it is very intensely described. It takes up maybe like two or three pages, actually. So it was nice that they only gave you the clip notes rather than, well, how extensive it was described in the book. Got uh, kind of steamy. In the movie, I do like this idea that John Galt is this mysterious shadow that just seems to take people away. However, I really gotta give it to the book more because in the book, there is a lot more of a mystery. Basically, all these random people are just disappearing for absolutely no reason. It's not until Dagny meets with one of her coal providers, Mr. Daniger, that she attaches that there is a person doing all this rather than some sort of mysterious force of nature doing all of it. So it adds a bit more to the mystery. I am also a little disappointed that they cut all the great talks that Eddie Wheeler's had with John Gelt at the station. It was able to provide a bit of character development as well as a way to introduce the character without actually telling you who he is. So I just, I just thought that was very clever writing, and quite frankly, that was just something I wanted to see adapted to the screen, but sadly, no. I do also love the idea that while the news is on in the diner, there is a brief mention of Robin Hood, the one person that the Finnish pirate wanted to kill. That was just another one of those good, hey, remember this? Boy? moments. The equalization of opportunity bill is very well described in the book and very well abridged in the movie. Now when we do skip ahead to why it's torch in the movie, I think it is very well shown. The only thing I just can't stand out of all the things in this movie is the idea that they give away John Gelt. I mean, John Gelt is not really shown until part three of the book. As it is in the movie, as Dagny is staring into the flames, you hear John Gelt talking to Alice Wyatt about Atlantis. You just completely destroyed the entire mystery that was kind of the bread and butter of this book. Now here's kind of the way I think about it. It's very similar to Jabba the Hutt in Star Wars. In the original cut of Star Wars, parts one and two, Jabba is described 
very much by a few of the characters and feared by so many. You kind of build him up to a bit of a legend. And then in part three, you finally get the reveal. And then you see if he lived up to your expectations or not. Very similar to how John Galt is presented in the book. And then in the remake of Star Wars, you briefly hear mention of Jabba the Hutt, and then he's just there. So take your presence, but personally, I just love a good mystery. And all the while, the book is just building up John Galt into basically a god. And it's even more amazing that with that much of a build-up, it actually all makes sense. All the fantastic things that were said about John Galt turned out to be true. Well, in the movie, it's more like, uh, oh, there's a rallying cry. Who is John Galt? Oh, that's who he is. Okay. All in all, though, I did rather like the movie. There were quite a few things I would do pretty differently. The two major things I would change. The setting, I could go back to the 1950s. There are a lot of reasons for this. The main thing is Dagny. In the 1950s, this was a time where women were not very well respected, and a woman in such a place of authority was practically unheard of. So the idea that she was able to start at the very bottom of the company and work her way up to the top That'd be impressive for a man, but it's even more impressive for a woman because she was able to earn all the respect of her co-workers. It adds so much more to the character. Meanwhile, in 2016, a woman CEO isn't really all that impressive anymore. Also, in the 50s, everybody smoked. If you want to build up the mystery of Atlantis, you gotta have smoking be a very common feature. You gotta have Dagny smoking. In fact, that is how she got the mysterious cigarette in the first place, drove back to the cigarette vendor, found out that it didn't exist, and then later found out that another cult member had an entire package of it, leading more scraps to the idea of finding Atlantis. It just adds so much more to it. And plus, in all honesty, I'm just a sucker for the Art Deco style. And obviously, the other big thing is, do not reveal John Galt until part three. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm perfectly fine with him being as a shadow, because there was a mysterious shadow in parts one and two that seemed to kind of follow around. And even mention that this shadow was a person when Cam Damager left. But come on, just to do John Galt dirty like that to explain why Ellis disappeared? It just kind of ruins the entire mystery. In fact, it throws out the mystery. It's just kind of like, hmm, who killed him? They did. Okay, arrest him. That's not exciting. You want to build it up. You want to make it more interesting. I mean, after all, this book... Is pretty thick. I don't mind taking my time. In fact, with a movie being a visual media, you could probably cut out at least a hundred pages of this because all of that is description, while a movie is something that can be done through cinematography. I feel like I'm starting to rant, but those are the two major things I would have done differently if I was in charge of the movie. I would have also added that great scene with the engineers because I just... I really wanted to see actors portray that. And also, I feel like the phrase, who is John Galt, is not really said as much in the movie as it should be. In the book, it very much gets to a point that Dagny hears this phrase at least every other day, and she just can't stand it because she associates it with giving up and just throwing in the towel when you need it the most. Now this is sort of brought across in the movie, but it doesn't really seem more like a, ooh, she's not gonna like that. It's more like a, hmm, what is that, so like the fifth time they said that? All in all though, if you have read the book and you want to watch the movie, I'd say they're both really good. But if you're trying to get into At the Shrug the first time and you're asking for my recommendation, I'd really have to go with the book. Yes, I know it's very intimidating, but 
the text isn't really all that small. And if you're like me, you'll probably just rip through this book in a few months. I have never been this vested in a book in my life. And plus, there is a lot more detail here. You can really get into the philosophy of Ayn. You can really get into the philosophy of all the characters in this book. Now, the movie does a pretty good job with some aspects. In the end, the book just has a lot more to offer. But that's because it has a lot more time, while the movie only has an hour and a half. So... That is my impression of part one. I hope you'll join me next time for part two. I'm really excited about part two because, like I said, part one was only an hour and a half. Part two is almost two hours, so there's a lot more to go over. <laughs> Personally, I'm just kind of looking forward to that scene where Hank's just in the middle of the road and the Finnish pirate gives him the bar of gold. <laughs> Either that or the scene where Dagny crashes her plane. There's, there's just so many good scenes that still remain in my head, even after several months of finishing this book. So, till next time, keep having fun.